Hello and welcome to Human Performance in Extreme Environments. Uh, in this video lecture, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of body temperature regulation. And there's a couple different areas that we want to cover. Probably the more important fundamental concept here is that of heat balance, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. We're going to talk in general about how the body regulates its temperature, some different theories and models as to how that happens. And then we're going to finish off by talking about some thermal stress scales. So let's start off with that first area, heat balance. And in particular, we're going to talk about the heat balance equation and some factors that affect heat exchange in humans, how you gain and lose heat. And then we're going to talk about a couple special areas where you can lose heat, for example, or potentially gain heat. So one is the respiratory area of heat exchange or the avenue. And the other one is the effects of clothing on uh, how you hold or dissipate heat. First off, the most important thing that you need to understand is where heat comes from in the body. And the human, the, the normal human body temperature, it's somewhere around 37 degrees Celsius. And it is, is regulated in a very, very narrow range. And this body heat is generated through inefficient cellular reactions. So, you know, all of those basic cellular reactions that are responsible for moving proteins around the cells, for letting insulin in or in, in, outside of tissues, uh, everything from maintaining your heart beating to allowing your eyes to move around, keeping your, all, all of your organs working, your liver functioning, all of these cellular reactions ultimately give off heat. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, uh, all of those cellular, cellular reactions, they're extremely inefficient. So let's say we're talking about muscles. Now in order for your muscle to contract, ultimately what needs to happen is you need to break apart a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. And then that will set in motion a series of events that ultimately lead to shortening of muscle cells. And then you can shorten the big muscle, and then you can shorten you know, the, the, the bone, you can pull on the bone, and then you can move. But for all of that to happen, you need to essentially break apart this small molecule called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Now, unfortunately, uh, about 30% of that energy that comes from breaking apart that ATP molecule is used to shorten that muscle or to actually perform the work. The remaining 70% of the energy from that one chemical reaction that splits apart ATP, it's released as heat. And so what happens is, you know, deep inside your cellular tissues, your, your muscle cells, you break apart ATP, and then some of that energy is used to shorten muscle cells. But then what happens is a lot of that energy is dissipated as heat. It will move outside of the cell, this heat. It will move into the tissues. It will move into all the surrounding fluid around the cells. It'll start to warm up the tissue temperature. It'll start to warm up the blood temperature and then that blood will be pumped around the body and that will in turn increase the temperature of the rest of the body. And so when you're talking about the sum of all of these cellular reactions all over the body um, that generate heat, that's referred to as metabolic heat production. And in total, you probably know that as just your metabolism. So I'm sure you can probably uh, think of the, the ramifications of all this. If you're constantly generating this heat from all your cellular reactions, which are happening every second of every day, then you're going to be generating a lot of heat. But if you don't dissipate this heat, then you're very soon going to accumulate so much heat that you can become hyperthermic. Now, the temperature ultimately that your cells are destroyed with heat, it's about 46 degrees Celsius. And so when you think about it, if your body temperature is maintained at 37 degrees Celsius, if you're to generate enough heat through all these inefficient cellular reactions such that your body keeps on increasing its temperature just by you know, less than 10 degrees Celsius, 9 degrees Celsius, then your proteins in your cells will heat up so much that they will denature. And that means that they will be destroyed and they'll cease working. A good way to think about what proteins look like or what they do when they denature is when you 
uh, take an egg and you crack it in a frying pan, first it's clear, but as the egg starts to heat up and starts to cook, it turns white. That's proteins denaturing. And that same thing essentially happens to your cells when they reach just a small increase in, in temperature up to 46 degrees Celsius. So my point that I want to make here is uh, human body temperature, it's arrived at throughout all of these inefficient cellular reactions, but because there's so many cellular reactions heating up the body constantly, we need to have a method for dissipating all of this heat. And you know, we're just talking about heat when you're sat down and just living or when you're sleeping. As you start to get up and move around and start to exercise more, then the metabolic heat production increases, your muscle work increases heat production, and your body temperature can shoot up very rapidly. So you need to have a way of getting rid of this heat. So body temperature, it's ultimately maintained by trying to balance the heat generation from all of your cells with the heat loss from all of these mechanisms and avenues that we're going to learn about a little bit in this lecture here. And so the reason why the heat balance equation is so important, it identifies these sources of heat loss and identifies the sources of heat gain uh, and tells us exactly where we're generating heat, where we're losing heat as well. So uh, there's some pretty important principles even uh, on this slide. So what you're looking at here on the top is the heat balance equation. And I figured the best way to, to go through this heat balance equation is just to define every term within it. And you need to know these. So first off, let's start with the highlighted term S. And S stands for body heat storage. It's the amount of heat that's stored in your body at any given moment. It's measured in watts per meter squared. Watts is just a measure of work or, or uh, energy. And you can have a positive value for this body heat storage or you can have a negative value. And this kind of makes sense, I think, right? Because if you have a positive value of heat storage, it represents the body gaining heat, which can happen when you say increase the amount of work you're doing or exercise. Or you can have a negative value for body heat storage and that might represent uh, a state of heat loss. Say if you jump in a, a, in a cold water on a cold day, then you'll rapidly lose body heat and that S value will be negative. So that's ultimately what we're, what we're talking about here, this constant change in body heat storage and all the factors on the right of the equal sign uh, determine whether you're positive or negative. So that first area that we want to talk about, it's M, it's metabolic heat production. And we already talked about this. This is determined by the rate of cellular reactions in the body. You know, this is the inefficiency of cellular reactions that are generating all the heat that makes your body temperature what it is. There's many different ways that you can measure this, but we can say measure this in our own laboratory at Salem State University um, by measuring the amount of energy that's ultimately dispersed in your expired oxygen. And so that's what you're looking at here on the right is you have these tubes hooked up to this face mask which allow you to breathe normal air in from the room and then the valve closes when you breathe out and you can breathe that, that air out and then you can collect that air that you breathed out and you can analyze it for the amount of oxygen that's in there uh, and you ultimately can calculate uh, how much energy that you're consuming, how much energy you're generating and indirectly how much heat that you're, you're generating and turning over. So let's move on to W. Now all W stands for is work. And this is obviously going to be subtracted from the total heat production. It normally represents a pretty big source of, of heat production. And so the best way to think about W is work. So if you're running or exercising, so the image I've chosen here uh, is, you know, defines the physical definition of work where it's a change in you know, mass from low to high. And, but it also describes the exercise com component. So the most important thing that I want you to understand here is W stands for work, which is just the external work performed by the individual. And you could think of that as exercise. So we have metabolic heat production and work. Both of those in general are going to cause the body to heat up. But as I mentioned, you know, all these cellular reactions, they generate a lot of heat and you have to be able to dissipate that heat. And a lot of those dissipation methods are described in the next couple slides. So the first one we want to talk about, it's radiative heat exchange. So when we talk about radiative heat exchange, we're talking about a transfer of thermal energy, particularly by electromagnetic waves, 
between you and the environment. And it can be positive or it can be negative. So in general, it's important to understand that heat is radiated down a thermal gradient from hot to cold. And so what you're looking at in this image right here, it's a, it's a thermal image taken of uh, a person playing uh, sports. So what you can see here is the red areas are associated with high temperatures and then the blue areas are associated with cooler temperatures. And it kind of makes sense in this image because you know, your arms are doing a lot of the work to swing the racket so you're going to see increased temperatures in the muscles because they're generating a lot of heat to hold that racket. The calves are, are you know, um, generating force to move the body and then you, know, you have all sorts of other muscles working as well. And then your head is a pretty important area for, for heat dissipation. It's also quite a selfish area because it makes sure it gets enough blood all the time because your brain's in your head and so this reflects the importance of blood flow to your brain and it also illustrates what we were talking about before where a lot of uh, the heat in our body is moved around in the blood and because your brain has a pretty rich blood supply you're going to also see an increased temperature there but what you're seeing in this whole image is the thermographic camera capturing radiation waves these electromagnetic waves and it's going to show you different colors associated with heat and cold and so in this particular example you're seeing hot areas around the upper body uh, and uh, cool areas uh, elsewhere so as i said uh, radiation can be positive or negative so a good example here is let's say you're outside uh, and it's a sunny day you're um, on a hot summer day in particular you, your skin is going to absorb that heat, those electromagnetic waves, and your skin is going to heat up. Now, on the other side, however, your skin is probably, on a cold day in particular, going to lose heat to the environment if you're on a cold winter day, and let's say maybe there's no sun. So what's going to happen is all of this heat that your body naturally generates will radiate toward the cold environment. So the point that I wanted to illustrate here is that radiation it can act to heat the body up say if the sun is out in particular if it's a warm day then your body will absorb that heat from the sun uh, or if it's a cold day then your body uh, and there's no sun your body can give up heat via these electromagnetic waves to the environment the next one that we wanted to mention factor in the equation it's conduction and conduction is very simply the transfer of thermal energy via direct contact of an object between you and the environment. And it can be positive or negative. And a good way to think about this is shown with the image on the right here. Now, in this image, you have the individual holding a metal uh, spike and they're holding the other end of the metal of the spike over uh, a flame. So what ends up happening is that flame heats up one end of the metal spike and then that metal, the heat, slowly warms up and then that heat is transferred from the, from the hot end of the spike to the cold end and eventually that cold end will be hot and the hand will then start to increase temperature as a result of that. And so what you're seeing here is an increased temperature, increased perception of temperature as well eventually um, by a conduction. Now, importantly, conduction, it can be positive or it can be negative. The same principle applies as radiation. Heat is radiated down a thermal gradient from hot to cold. So what you're gonna see here in examples when heat gain is positive, that's really the, the example we're seeing here in the image where you gain heat. Um, but another way to think about this is let's say that you have an injury and you are applying a hot water bottle to your skin. Well then your skin is gonna heat up because of direct physical contact between the hot water in the bottle and then the bottle is touching your skin, increasing the temperature via conduction. But at the same time, or alternatively, you can have the opposite happen. Uh, so the negative side of this is, say if you had an ice pack, you put the ice pack on your skin, then the ice will then uh, pull heat from your skin. And again, that's through direct conduction. So in that way, conduction, it can be positive or negative. And we have convection. So convection in particular, it's the transfer of thermal energy via direct contact of a fluid or a gas between you and the environment. And again, it can be positive or negative. So in general, and again, heat is radiated down this thermal gradient from hot to cold. 
And so the best way to think about this is, so let's say um, we're talking about your skin. You can have a positive gain or heat gain in your skin when you're immersed in a hot bath. So here we're talking about the transfer direct contact of hot water on your skin. This shouldn't be uh, the same or considered the same as conduction because conduction when you when your skin heated up uh, when you put the water bottle against your skin it wasn't because water was contacting your skin there was a probably a, a plastic medium in between them that's the water bottle so in that sense it was conduction but here in this case in this example we have a hot fluid directly in contact with your skin that will heat up your skin but you can also have the same thing with a gas like air and the best way to think about this is you know on a, on a cold day maybe you'll bring out your space heater and turn it on and it'll heat up the air and then blow it at you if the if the air temperature and the heater is hotter than that of your skin then you're going to gain heat so in this first example we're talking about how convection can uh, add to a positive heat gain but as you can imagine the exact opposite can also happen your skin can lose heat it can be negative and the exact same thing can happen here where you're immersed in a bath, but now if the water is cold, if the water is colder than your skin in particular, then you're going to lose heat to that conduction, or, or rather the convection, the fluid. Uh, or if you're in front of a, an air conditioner, the air conditioner, whole, the whole design is to cool the air and then blow it at you and then hopefully cool your skin. So what you're seeing here on the right are a couple of images of that. Now, one of the reasons why cycling is, is, uh, is a good sport is because, especially in the, in the heat and a hot day, uh, it has a lot of convection to help cool you. But if you're inside cycling, then you don't have a lot of that convective heat loss. So a lot of people will put fans in front of them to try to enhance cooling uh, to mimic what it's like outside with the wind, with the convective heat loss. Similarly, uh, if you're in a cold water bath, which is what you're seeing on the bottom right, then uh, you will see enhanced heat loss if the water is moving around, if it's stirred, than compared to if the water is just still. Because what can happen is if you're in a cold water bath and the water isn't stirred, then the heat will then move away from your skin and it'll start to warm up this, this little layer of water that's closest to your skin. And that can actually act to help defend your body temperature. But if the water is stirred in this bath, then also if you're in a cold water bath, it can uh, act to cause a faster reduction in your skin temperature. So of course the speed of this air moving over your skin can certainly affect the thermal gradient. And so if you're having very fast moving air or fast moving water, so if you're outside on a very cold or very windy day, then you're going to see enhanced heat loss from your skin compared to on a day where the wind isn't very uh, strong. And we're gonna talk about this idea at the end of this video lecture, that's the wind chill scale. The same thing, if you dip your hand in a, a very fast flowing river, then uh, that's gonna be able to pull heat from your skin much more quickly than um, a slow moving river. There's one more point that I wanted to make about conduction and convection. And this is probably rather intuitive to you. Different objects, like different types of metals or different fluids, different gases, for example, they have different conductivities and this can alter heat balance. So for example, the most important one that I like uh, students in this class to understand is that of water versus air. Water has a thermal conductivity that's about 27 times greater than air. So let's say that you're in an air temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. You're probably gonna find that rather comfortable not uncomfortable but if you're in a water temperature of 15 degrees celsius then you are going to find that extremely uncomfortable and that's probably because the water is pulling heat from your skin more rapidly water has this unique ability to absorb a lot of heat in fact one of the reasons why um, you know humans are great at exercising in the heat compared to say other animals is that we have the ability to sweat and so what happens is when sweat uh, is, is acting its best is when it's removed from your blood, that's the water, and then put on top of your skin. 
And then when that water is on your hot skin, when you're exercising or on a hot day, that water will absorb a whole bunch of heat from your skin and then it will evaporate. And it's that process of evaporating that allows your body to cool. And the main reason why that can happen is because water has this amazing thermal conduct conductivity that is 27 times greater than, than air. So as I just uh, mentioned, evaporation uh, is pretty important for heat loss. And it's really in humans the main source of, of, of heat loss. So here, when we're talking about evaporation, we're talking about the transfer of thermal energy that's in particular via the evaporation of water from the skin between you and the environment. And as I said, this is mostly negative, which means that it contributes to heat losses. And so this is kind of just summarizing what I just said. Water is secreted on the skin by sweat glands, and then the water will absorb heat from the skin, and then it will evaporate, and that's how primarily you cool the, um, the, the skin. The important thing to remember here is in this image, you can see that this person has kind of shaken all of their sweat off. So when sweat drips off the skin, that means that it wasn't given an opportunity to fully absorb the heat from the skin. And so what that means is that it's not gonna be effective at cooling you. What you wanna do is when you're exercising and in, in, in it's hot outside, you don't really wanna wipe sweat off of your skin. You wanna wait until that sweat absorbs enough thermal energy that it evaporates on its own because it's that process of evaporation, the conversion of the liquid to the gas in the environment that removes the heat from your skin and actually cools you. So in this case, it's a very subtle nuanced understanding here, but that sweat that's flying off this individual, it has no thermoregulatory function. It's just causing a puddle on the ground. There's one really important point about evaporation and sweating. The evaporation of water from your skin, it's determined by the amount of water vapor that's in the air around you. So when you have an increased water vapor in the air, which is associated with a high relative humidity, then there's less room for, if you want to think of it this way, the, the water molecules to evaporate from your skin and then be forced into the air because there's already a lot of water vapor in the air. So there's not a lot of room for those water vapor molecules from your skin to fit in the air. So what that means is you're gonna see uh, a reduced evaporation of water from the skin. So ideally what you wanna have is a situation where you have low water vapor in the air, i.e. when it's a low relative humidity, because when you're exercising in that situation, you're gonna be able to evaporate a lot of water, a lot of sweat from the skin. And again, the point here is to lower your skin temperature when you're exercising uh, to prevent your body from overheating. And so you can increase water evaporation from the skin when there's a lower relative humidity. So the amount of water vapor that's in the air is determined primarily by air temperature. And so warm air temperature generally holds more water than colder air temperatures, but you still can have a high humid day in the winter. But this is important because what it means is when you're exercising in the heat, then your main avenue for cooling your body is gonna be the evaporation of sweat. And what this slide is telling you is you're going to have a hard time evaporating a lot of your sweat when it's very hot and humid you're gonna have an easier time evaporating a lot of your sweat when it's hot and, uh, w and has a low level of humidity. And that's why it's so dangerous to exercise and spend a lot of time moving around and working in hot and very humid uh, environments. So I got a quick question for you to, to think about. Would you rather exercise in 40 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Celsius? Now your immediate answer is probably gonna be, oh yeah, 30 degrees Celsius for sure. But some of you might be thinking, ah, hang on. You didn't give me enough information. What really matters is the amount of water vapor in the air because if you're exercising, we know you're generating a lot of heat through all of these metabolic reactions. Your body can get very hot. And if you're in a very hot environment, then obviously that can reduce the amount of heat that you're able to dissipate but the temperature alone doesn't matter. What really matters is your ability to evaporate water from your skin. And the environmental factor that most influence that, it's not the temperature, 
it's the humidity, the relative humidity. So in this example, what you're seeing is on the vertical axis, you're looking at water vapor pressure in the air. And on the horizontal axis, you're looking at temperature. And so here, what you're looking at is just that example we talked about, 30 degrees Celsius, which is common in a lot of jungle conditions. And in a lot of jungle conditions, you're gonna have a higher relative humidity. There's a lot more water vapor in the air. And so what this means is at 30 degrees Celsius and 70% relative humidity, you're not gonna be able to evaporate very much sweat. If you're in a desert condition that's actually hotter, say 40 degrees Celsius, um, oftentimes desert conditions will have a lower relative humidity. They're gonna be a little bit more dry. So really, if you had to decide between both of these environments, you should choose the desert condition because it has a lower relative humidity and you'll be able to enhance evaporative heat loss under these conditions. And it's evaporative heat loss that's going to allow your body to regulate its temperature more effectively. There's a couple of less commonly discussed avenues for heat exchange and heat balance that I wanna briefly mention here. And one, it's the respiratory system. And that's a major avenue for conductive and convective evaporative heat exchange. And it's important to understand that with each inhale, your body will warm and humidify the air. So that's why we can function in very dry environments. Ultimately, the goal is to match um, the external air with the internal environment so that you can match body temperature. And then with each exhale, you will lose heat and you'll also lose water vapor. And that's what's shown in this image on the right. You can see this individual wearing a mask uh, and as they breathe out, a lot of the humidity in that air is being trapped up and then breathed out against the glasses. And you can see that the water vapor is starting to build up on the inside of their glasses. And that just emphasizes the point here is that with each exhale, you're losing some water vapor. And so this is another important point. Um, there are many avenues for, uh, for the evaporation of water uh, and um, they can ultimately have a pretty big impact on not just how you regulate your body temperature, but your hydration status as well. So what you're looking at here, it's just a handy little pair of diagrams that just talk about all the different avenues of body heat gain and uh, body heat losses in air and in the water. On the left hand side of the slide, you're looking at the normal avenues for both of those things in the air. And then on the right hand side, you're looking at the normal avenues when you're immersed in water. So what you're seeing here is all the different avenues. You can see radiation, um, you can see in a hot environment with lots of sun, you'll gain heat probably, but in a cold environment, you'll generally lose heat through radiation. With evaporation, you're gonna see breath, and then there's always an insensible heat loss or water from your skin. You can see convection, uh, which can either add or cause losses. Over here, you can see the combination of evaporation, adding and losing. Here you can see, uh, again, the radiant effect of potentially the ground and then the conduction right here. So you can see the combination of heat losses and then, and then heat stored on the left and the right hand side of this image. If you look at the same conditions in water, basically what you're seeing is the large arrows represent the largest areas of heat loss. And the most important thing here that I want you to understand is of course, compare the different avenues between these two, but also what matters is the medium. Remember, water has uh, a capacity to remove heat that's about 27 times greater than air. So you're gonna see heat removed much more quickly when you're immersed in water uh, than you are the same temperature in air. In any case, um, I thought these might be a useful tool for you to try to understand a lot of these principles that we've been talking about. Okay, now let's talk about some of the effects of clothing on heat balance. Now, before we get into the slide, I want to remind you what are some of the big factors that influence uh, heat loss from the body. So if you're exercising in the heat, then you know already based upon what we talked about, one of the biggest factors that influences how hot we get is our ability to evaporate sweat from the skin. And one of the factors that primarily influences our ability to evaporate sweat from the skin, it's the water vapor in the atmosphere, right? So if you have a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, then you have an impaired ability to lose heat through sweating. If you have low amount of water in the atmosphere, 
then you're probably going to be able to evaporate a lot of your sweat and that'll help cool you off. So what we're looking at here in this image, it's the effect of clothing ultimately on heat loss. And so the short answer is clothing can decrease evaporative heat loss, but we're going to talk about why. So here's the skin. And then let's say you're wearing some clothing and theoretically you can imagine there's going to be this air gap between your skin and the clothing. This area is called the microenvironment. Now what can happen is when you're exercising, uh, you're going to be sweating, you're going to be pushing water out on top of your skin, you're going to be seeing increased heat dissipating. All of that is going to increase the temperature in this microenvironment. And not only that, you have to think about the water. What's going to happen is that water is going to increase the water vapor pressure in this microclimate, in this microenvironment. And so what ends up happening when you see a lot of water building up in this area? Well, that increases the water vapor pressure. When you increase the water vapor pressure in this microenvironment, you decrease your skin's ability to evaporate the water. And so you decrease the ability of the skin to lose heat to this microenvironment. And effectively, you've just impaired your body temperature regulation capacity. So what you should be looking for in clothing if you want to exercise with clothing on, if it's cold outside and you want to make sure that you're enhancing sweating losses, is you need to make sure that this clothing is permeable. The water needs to be able to pass from the skin through this microenvironment and then through the clothing and then to be dissipated to the environment. And so this is the best case scenario for clothing right here. And this is the worst case. When you start to see a wear impermeable clothing, like say a big raincoat, then you're going to see increases in water vapor pressure here and it's going to prevent sweat from um, being evaporated and cooling your skin. And that can represent a, thermal, a thermally dangerous environment. Okay, so let's change gears here. Let's talk about, in general, how humans are thought to regulate their body temperature. And there's a couple different uh, models here that we're going to talk about. One is the adjustable set point theory, which is proposed a long time ago. Another one is recipro reciprocal inhibition. It's been around for a little while. And then um, the model of heat regulation. So let's talk about each one of these in, uh, in turn. Okay, so starting with that first one, the adjustable set point model. Ultimately, what this theory says is that uh, in your body, you have temperature sensors located in your skin, but those sensors are also loaded, located deep in the body. Ultimately, those sensors will then collect information about the temperature in your skin and deep in your body, and it will send that information up to your brain to a particular area called your hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is the area where uh, your body temperature is regulated. Now, ultimately, these signals that are coming in from these temperature sensors will be compared to an internal set point that's set by the hypothalamus. And if there's a difference, then corrective action will be taken. And this is exactly like a thermostat in your home. Uh, it's the same setup, really. Now, in this setting also, body temperature, it's the controlled variable. So for example, you have temperature sensors will send cooling signals to the hypothalamus, and that will ultimately cause a heat gain response. So if your skin is cooling, um, then that means your body needs to act because you're probably in a cold environment. So we'll act by uh, decreasing skin blood flow to prevent heat losses to the environment. And then that'll encourage heat storage within your body. There are some criticisms with this theory. You can't really explain the observation that the body temperature set point changes during times um, that are very common. Fever, for example. Um, the actual set point changes. And during menstruation, there are subtle changes in body temperature um, that are evident throughout the entire menstrual cycle. So this theory, it had bits that were right with it, but it doesn't really take into account this particular, uh, these particular issues, the fever and body temperature changes that are normal during menstruation. Uh, and then people respond to this criticism by saying, well, you know, it's not just a set point. It varies uh, in some ranges. Uh, and so, for example, your body temperature is not 37.1. It ranges from 37.0 to 37.4, for example. 
Of course, it depends on where you measure your body temperature as well. Anyway, another theory that came after the set point theory to try to describe some of these issues and you know, explain some of the issues that we just mentioned was the reciprocal inhibition model. Basically what the theory says is it agrees with the last model in that you have temperature sensors located in the skin and deep in the body and these sensors send signals to the hypothalamus. Everyone agrees on that. The difference with the reciprocal inhibition model basically says that you can't have heating and cooling at the same time. One is turned off, the other one is turned on. So for example, cold sensors on a cold day would send signals um, from the skin and deep in the body to the hypothalamus saying that you're, you're cold. And so your body, triggered by the hypothalamus, would initiate a heat storage response. And the key component to this model is that when you're initiating the heat storage response, your body will automatically turn off heat loss responses. And so in the alternative situation, if you're uh, outside on a hot day or if you're exercising, then these heat sensors will send hot signals to the hypothalamus again it'll initiate a heat loss response. So for example, you know, turn on sweating mechanisms, but at the exact same time, your body will also turn off heat storage responses, say like shivering. And so that's the, the key thing with this model is that it says when you turn one thing on, something else is turned off. That's the reciprocal inhibition part. Now there's no set point in this model. It argues that um, there is this, what's referred to as a null zone or a narrow range where body temperature is regulated. And there's a good amount of research to support that as well. But in this case, body temperature is still the controlled variable. So here's just a little summary of what's referred to as the null zone, basically what the reciprocal inhibition model says. So you're going to have, again, thermal sensors, as I've already mentioned, located deep in the skin and then deep in the body, and they will send signals to the brain. And if you have an overactivation of warm sensors, they will ultimately increase heat loss mechanisms, say, for example, sweating or panting in dogs, and they will, at the exact same time, turn off heat production mechanisms, cold, like shivering. Or if you're in a cold environment, you're going to see an increased output of cold signals moving up to your hypothalamus and that will trigger heat production responses and that's simply shivering for example and then when you're shivering it causes a decrease in the activity of these other pathways which is sweating obviously and this makes intuitive sense the last model that i wanted to mention it's called the heat regulation model and ultimately what the theory says is that you have temperature sensors, again, like the other models, located in the skin and deep in the body, except they don't just sense temperature. They sense the flow of heat. Now, these heat flow sensors, they will send signals to the hypothalamus, just like in previous models, to control, this time, thermal balance. Now, in this case, body temperature is not the regulated or the controlled variable. And ultimately, how it works is, so let's say that you're exercising. You're going to see increased heat generation from your muscles. And let's say you're exercising on a hot day uh, with the sun outside. You're gonna see increased gain of heat through radiant mechanisms and other mechanisms. Your skin temperature will heat up and also your muscles will be heating up from the exercise. That will lead to a thermal imbalance and a mass flow of heat. That will cause this increased heat loss ultimately uh, so you'll start to see increased vasodilation in the, in the skin to allow your hot blood to move closer to the skin to dissipate more heat, and you'll see increased sweating uh, in order to increase heat losses. These effectors, vasodilation and sweating, they're common in all the different mechanisms. Um, or we can talk about the opposite situation where you have a decreased body heat. So let's say that you're in a cold ice bath. So what ends up happening is that your body will very rapidly lose heat to the water, especially in water, because as we know, water has a thermal conductivity that is 27 times greater than air. That will cause a rapid reduction in your skin temperature. And so these heat flow sensors will detect this massive shift of heat flowing away from your body. And then that will initiate the heat storage mechanisms of vasoconstriction, which is just decreasing the size of your blood vessels to keep heat close to your body and deepen your internal organs. And also will increase the shivering response, which is just uh, your muscles contracting to ultimately generate heat to, to help restore your body. 
Now the main criticism of this is humans don't have heat flow sensors. We have temperature sensors. So it's not really clear where these heat flow sensors are coming from. A lot of this model makes sense if you just take out the notion that um, humans have these heat flow sensors. Rather, we just have temperature sensors. Um, and then the response to the temperatures, uh, response to this criticism is that you have temperature sensors located at different depths in the skin that ultimately contribute to your, your sensation of heat flow. And that's really, you know, still a criticism in and of itself. Okay, so I don't want you to go into a huge amount of detail uh, with the models. It's not something I want you to worry about too much. I just want you to have a basic understanding. Uh, so if you can gloss over and, and understand everything that I've mentioned on a superficial level, you'll be fine. So now let's turn our attention to thermal stress sca uh, scales. And we prim primarily want to look at heat stress scales and cold stress scales. Okay, so let's start off by looking at uh, the heat stress scale and let's talk about what the purpose is first. So, you know, when you're in a hot environment, there is a potential that you can get too hot uh, and that can lead to injuries like heat stroke and, and hyperthermia and even death. So the purpose of a heat stress scale is to ultimately predict the danger of hot environmental conditions to make sure that we're safe. And so the most important environmental factors that can influence how hot you get, one, it's, as we talked about, it's gonna be the ambient temperature, which controls convective heat gain. But more importantly, the relative humidity, that's really important, right? Because our main avenue for heat loss in, in warm environments is evaporative heat loss. And so if we have a high relative humidity, then you're not gonna be able to evaporate a lot of sweat. So these scales, they need to be sensitive to humidity. You want ultimately to identify safe environments to go and work and play in, and those are gonna be associated with lower relative humidity. And then of course, another important factor that influences you know, your risk is sunshine. And of course, that's radiant heat gain, right? If you're outside on a blistering hot day, there's uh, no cloud in the sky, then the sun is gonna be beating down on you and you're gonna see enhanced heat gain and that can predispose you for, for, for heat illness. But at the same time, if you're on a very cold day and the sun is beating down on you, that can actually have a protective effect. So a heat stress scale tries to account for all of these factors. Now, just as a, an aside, we're gonna talk about this later, but wind can increase heat losses, um, but this is in general a good thing. So we don't really talk about um, a lot of wind and the potential dangers of wind in, uh, uh, in a heat stress scale. There are some conditions in the desert, for example, if it's a very hot uh, condition, uh, then if it's windy and the wind and the air is hotter than your skin, then it actually can increase uh, heat gain and that can be dangerous. But it's very uncommon that that happens. So we've identified these important environmental factors. Now we want to talk about how we measure them to try to uh, arrive at, let's say, one number that can tell you how dangerous the environment is um, for heat stress. So one of the factors that we mentioned was the relative humidity. We can account for that in a very special way using one of these devices here that we'll, we'll talk about in a second here. Another factor is the sun that's radiating heat gain. This uh, particular device can account for that as well. And then of course you want to account for the, the ambient temperature and, and that's fairly easy to account for. So let's talk about this. What we're doing here is we're using a device called the WBGT. That's called the wet bulb globe temperature to represent heat stress. And so like I said, we need to measure each of those factors. Now this is the WBGT scale in operation. One thing that you notice is this big globe here. It's a black globe. You can see that also over here, this black sphere. In the center of this globe is a thermometer. I want you to imagine what would happen to the temperature of this thermometer if you put this black globe around it on a very sunny day. Now we know that when you wear dark clothes, for example, it will absorb a lot of heat from the sun, and that's true. So what you'd expect is if there's a lot of sun outside and you have this black globe positioned over this, this thermometer, then this black globe will heat up and then that will 
increase the temperature sensed by this thermometer. So you'll expect to see an increased temperature in this thermometer because it's surrounded by this black globe, especially on a sunny day. If, on the other hand, you just have alongside it just a normal dry temperature, then on a very sunny day, you would expect that the, the temperature, the thermometer, surrounded by the black globe would be greater. So this globe right here is sensitive to the radiant heat gain associated with the sun. This center temperature is really just for sensing ambient temperature. And on a very hot sunny day, the temperature here would probably be lower than the temperature for here because it doesn't have any way to absorb the radiant heat. So that takes into account both of these two important characteristics, the radiant heat gain from the sun and then the dry temperature. We also need to account for relative humidity. So that's what this other unit does right here. And you can see that uh, in, in the image right here. So what this does is this is a little cup and inside this cup there is water. And there's a little cloth that hangs down the center of this cup. And it's not really shown here, but this little cloth, it's made of muslin. And when you dip this cloth, in the water, the water will be absorbed all the way up the cloth and then it will ultimately saturate the entire cloth. Now, on a very dry day, what do you think would happen to the wetness of this cloth in a hot day? Well, if you said it, the water will evaporate, then you're right. So again, this, is, uh, this little muslin cloth is surrounding one of these thermometers. And so when this wet muslin cloth is surrounding this thermometer and the water is evaporating from it, what happens to the temperature of this thermometer? Well, when the water evaporates from this muslin cloth, then that water, because it has, remember this thermal conductivity that's 27 times greater than air, that will remove heat from the thermometer and that will cause the thermometer to be reduced in temperature. So what we're seeing here is we have a method to measure essentially the relative humidity of the environment. Um, we know that when it's a low humidity, then the water in this cloth will evaporate very quickly because there's a, a large thermal gradient between the water vapor on the cloth and then in the air. So what that means is on a very uh, low humidity day, the temperature on this thermometer will be a lot lower than the ambient temperature thermometer because the water is evaporating very quickly from it. On the other hand, if it's a very humid day, this water will not evaporate very quickly because there's not a lot of room in the atmosphere for those water vapor molecules to be forced from the muslin cloth into the air. So that means you're gonna see a slowed evaporation from that muslin cloth. And so in this way, you can predict how dangerous the environment is based upon its, its uh, relative humidity, the, the water vapor in the air. And so when you look at this whole unit in total, you have one, the ability to measure the dangers associated with the radiant heat gain, because here, uh, this black globe will heat up this thermometer. And then you have um, next to it over here, this little column, this senses the ambient temperature here and this diagram which is shown in the middle. And then in the center on this image and then on the end on this image, you have the ability to sense evaporative heat loss in the environment and indirectly it tells you what the, what the water vapor pressure is in the air. So in total, this WBGT measurement allows you to calculate the, the thermal stress or the heat stress of an environment. Actually, there's, there's one more thing that I, I didn't mention here. Um, we talked a little bit about which one of these factors is most dangerous. Now, just to remind you, you know, we know that our, the main avenue of heat loss for the body is evaporative heat loss. The, the body's main avenue for dissipating heat is going to be sweat losses. So what that means is that of these temperatures, the globe, the dry, and then the, the wet temperature, the one that's gonna be probably most 
predictive of your ability to thermoregulate is probably going to be the, the wet globe temperature right here because it tells you how much water vapor is in the air. So this temperature is probably the most important. The next one that can influence you know, your, your heat gain, as you probably know, it's gonna be this one over here because it's sensitive to the radiant heat gain, the sun. So what this means is when we're calculating or when we're trying to calculate one number that represents how dangerous an environment is, we want to give more weighting to the, the number that we get from, from this thermometer, a little bit less weighting to the number we get from this thermometer, and then the least weighting we get to this dry thermometer. And that's actually what we're seeing right here in this equation. We take, let's say, the number that we get from the wet globe is, say, 30 degrees Celsius. Well, what we do is we take that number and multiply it by 0.7. Uh, and then let's say, again, we take uh, a number over here and let's say it's 31 uh, degrees Celsius. We'll take that number and then we'll multiply by 0.2 so it has a smaller weighting. So far the bigger weighting is 0 0.7 multiplied by this temperature. Uh, 0 0.2 multiplied by the globe temperature. And then 0 0.1 multiplied by the dry temperature. So what this does is it places a higher number, a higher weighting on the temperature we think is most important. And then that you add them all together to get one number. So in that way, this one number, the one WBGT number you get, it's mostly influenced by the, the, the temperature of the, the muslin cloth, the, the, wet, um, the wet measurement here. Next influenced by the next most important one, which is the globe, and then least by the, the dry temperature. Okay, so that's, that explains how we get the, uh, the WBGT number. So what you're looking at here is categories for those one number, those one WBGT numbers. And so we have categories one, two, and three. Category one is always gonna be a little bit safer than category two, which is gonna be a little bit safer than category three. And so again, just imagine here that you've taken a WBGT measurement, uh, you've, let me go back up here, you've applied these calculations and you got your one WBGT number. And then you compare it to where it is here to identify what that number is. And here we're, we see numbers in, in Fahrenheit and Celsius for you. So we might as well go by Fahrenheit now. So if you got a WBGT that's less than 76.1, then you can, Follow the guidelines here. It says, you know, follow with normal activities. And that extends all the way up to um, less than 82 um, Fahrenheit. So in this zone, you know, you're pretty good to go. But as you start to see increased temperatures, you know, in the 76.3 to 81, 79.9 to 84.6, or 82.2 to 86.6, then you see the guideline here. You get the yellow light. Use discretion. So in this way, you can see as the temperatures start to increase the WBGT, then you start to get specific guidelines. Here, maximum practice time, two hours for football. Uh, restrict helmet use. All of these things are designed to keep people safe in these higher WBGTs. And as you start to get up to here, again, 84, all the way up to 91.9, category one through category three. Maximum practice time for football, one hour. Uh, and then here, all the way up at the top, 86.2 to 92.1, uh, anything greater than that. No outdoor workouts. Delay practice until a cooler WBGT is reached. So this is a very useful tool that you can use and easily calculate yourself to, you know, based upon different environmental conditions to see how, to see how dangerous they are. Um, and here, uh, if you want, you can see the original source uh, for where this stuff came from. I know this is a little bit confusing, so I wanted to walk through a specific example. So here it is. Let's see. Um, let, let, let's say that we have uh, the weather network, and it's calling for a high of 30 degrees Celsius, which is 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is dry. That means that it's not very humid. There's a low relative humidity, and it is cloudy, and it is windy. So here's a sample of your WBGT measures. The temperature of the globe, remember that's the one that's surrounded by that black globe, it's 30 degrees Celsius. 
the, the temperature of the dry ambient temperature outside, it's 25 degrees Celsius. So 30 degrees Celsius for the globe, 25 for the dry. You can see the Fahrenheit equivalents here, 86 and 77. And then the wet temperature, remember it's dry, so you're gonna see rapid evaporation of that muslin cloth, the water from it to the environment. That means that this is gonna be the lowest temperature in the whole lot, 20 degrees Celsius and about 68 Fahrenheit. So this is the WBGT equation. We multiply 0 0.7 by the W globe temperature, that's the wet globe, so 68. We multiply 0 0.2 by the globe temperature, 86, and then 0 0.1 by the dry temperature, 77. If we do all that, then you can see how it all multiplies out here. You can look through this on your own time. The ultimate WBGT that we get for Fahrenheit, it's 81.5. If we go and classify that, we're gonna, we're gonna see that we are at a category three. And so what that means is you can continue with normal activities, provide at least three separate rest breaks each hour with minimum duration of three minutes each. So the short answer here is uh, on this 30 degrees Celsius day, you're good to go with a category three because, uh, because it is dry and it's cloudy and it's windy. 30 degrees Celsius. 86 Fahrenheit. Let's have a look at the next slide. So here, the weather network is calling for the same temperature, 30 degrees Celsius, but now it's humid. That means there's a lot of water vapor in the air. It's sunny. That means that there's gonna be a lot of sun beating down on you, and there's no wind. There's decreased convective heat losses, okay? So our WBGT measurements, the globe temperature on this 30 degrees Celsius day is gonna be reading higher then the globe temperature, it's 35 degrees Celsius, 95. And then the dry temperature, 30 degrees Celsius. It would be lower if there was wind, it would enhance convective heat loss from that, but it's not, so you're sticking with 86. And then the wet globe temperature is running at 86 because you're not seeing any evaporation of that muslin cloth because there's too much water in the atmosphere. So when you multiply out your factors according to what we just did, 0 0.7 multiplied by the wet globe, uh, 0 0.2 multiplied by the globe temperature and then 0 0.1 by the dry. When you multiply it all out, your WBGT works out to be 92.4 Fahrenheit. You were up here at category three with 30 degrees Celsius and the other condition, but now you're all the way down at the bottom, 92.4. That suggests that you should have no outdoor workouts. Delay practice until a cooler WBGT is reached. This is all at the same temperature. They're both 86 Fahrenheit. That shows you how important humidity, sun is, and then possibly convection as well. So I hope this little example helps illustrate the importance of environmental factors on the heat balance equation, how you can regulate your body temperature. When it comes time for you to put together your case presentation, this is something that I need you to talk about. You need to talk about how the heat balance equations and the environmental conditions influence your case study. Now there are some limitations to the WBGT. It takes a long time to measurement actually. Um, and so you have to sit this device outside for a longer period of time. It's not very useful also in rapidly changing environmental conditions and it's pretty difficult for most people to understand. We had pretty much a whole lecture on it and hopefully now you can understand exactly what it means. And so ultimately what, what it means is that number that you get from the WBGT, it's gonna be a little bit obscure for a lot of people and so it's less likely to be widely adopted. That's why it's important to have national services that can provide the interpretation uh, and tell you exactly what you need to know so you know, you'll be able to keep most people safe. But now you know exactly what these numbers mean. So now let's turn our attention to cold stress scales. So what's the point of a cold stress scale? Well, just like the heat stress scale, the purpose of a cold stress uh, scale is to predict the danger of environmental conditions, to prevent injuries like non-freezing cold injuries or hypothermia where your body temperature drops down to a dangerous level. So what primarily contributes to cold stress uh, in an environment? What are the biggest dangers? Well, here it's going to be a very low ambient temperature. And also, you're going to see, you know, potentially, you know, the, the main issue coming with enhanced convective heat losses. What is very important to be mindful of in a cold condition is wind speed. 
it matters a lot more in cold conditions than it does in warm conditions. And this is because it really enhances convective heat loss. Both of those factors, the ambient temperature and the wind, are combined in what's referred to as the wind chill index. There are other factors that you could consider in a cold stress scale. So for example, sunshine, like a globe temperature, that ultimately is going to have a positive effect on heat gain. It's gonna decrease radiant heat gain. And relative humidity, it's not often a huge factor in, in cold conditions. Okay, so let's talk about this, uh, this figure here, what we're looking at. On the vertical axis, we're looking at wind speed measured in miles per hour. And then on the top horizontal axis, we're looking at temperature in, in degrees Fahrenheit. And so uh, on, the, um, on the, uh, the, the top scale, horizontal, we're starting up at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we're dropping down in five degrees uh, Fahrenheit increments all the way down to zero. And then we're continuing on colder and colder and colder until negative 45. And then the wind speed starts at calm down to five increases in, in increments all the way up to 60 miles per hour. So what you're seeing is pretty much in this zone when the temperature is you know, all the way down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very cold, um, and even at very high wind speeds, you're hitting temperatures around you know, minus 11 or so with that wind speed. In all of the, these areas, you're not at a huge risk for um, say frostbite. And so this is reflected down here in this color coded aspect of the chart, frostbite times. And we're gonna talk more about cold injuries in a future area. The main point is just to show you the effect of, of temperature and wind speed on this frostbite time. Once you get down to um, you know, around 10, five, zero uh, in this region, and the wind speed picks up, you start to see uh, frostbite becoming an issue. So if you're outside in these temperatures, anywhere from you know, minus 35 um, with a low temperature of, or so a low wind speed of five miles per hour, or minus, or, or sorry, 10 degrees Fahrenheit with a wind speed of 60 miles per hour, you're probably gonna get frostbite in some of the region of 30 minutes. Down to 10 minutes in here, you can see um, what happens if you're, uh, again, low wind speed with a low temperature, you're likely to get frostbite in 10 minutes or so. You can see how the, the, the trend continues. So the, the main point of this slide is to just show you the effect of wind and low temperatures on your susceptibility to, to frostbite. And just to illustrate the point that wind is probably the biggest factor that you need to take into consideration when identifying cold injury. Um, but temperature is also a pretty important factor uh, as well. There certainly are a lot of limitations to this wind chill index. In general, it overestimates the effect of convective cooling on human tissue. Uh, and the original uh, experiments were conducted in a situation that is not necessarily reflective of, uh, of what most people would find. Um, so that's it for this video lecture. Uh, I hope that you now have a good understanding of the fundamentals of body temperature regulation. It's one of the more important foundational lectures that we'll have in this class. So go over it a couple times and then dig into it, uh, the reading if you want more details. But at the end of the day, you're going to be held to account for everything that was mentioned in this video lecture. Okay, so uh, let's leave it there.